ground zero of the whole operation of like deciding what America was going to be and, and formulating a democracy that has, has now outlasted the Athenian. And Thomas Jefferson was like, you know, it's going to be an agrarian nation. And that must have made sense to Thomas Jefferson because he was living in Virginia and he was surrounded by farmers and farmland. Because Alexander Hamilton, who was a New Yorker, was like, it's going to be a manufacturing nation. And that must have made sense to Alexander Hamilton because he was in New York and he was surrounded by the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. And the proof that Alexander Hamilton was right is that his grave today sits directly across the street from a shoe outlet. <laughs> <laughs> and these very low priced shoes that you can shop for while you also pay homage to the founding father. <laughs> <laughs> this is Robert Fulton, who was the inventor of the steamboat on the Hudson oh, River. Wow. We got a lot of all-stars in this cemetery. Oh, yeah. Yeah, here's the shoe outlet. You can see, you're probably the lowest price in the city. It's no small affair. We are probably. Yeah. It's, it's, it's <laughs> even, <laughs> even they're suspect. <laughs> yeah, man. And then here's his wife, Eliza. And his daughter, the daughter of the sorcerer from the Revolution of Lazarus. And there's my And you know, he was killed in a pistol duel. That Aaron Burr in Weehawk, New Jersey. And Trinity Church had made a declaration just before that that they weren't going to have any casualties of pistol duels buried in their cemetery because they wanted uh, a ban on pistol duels. They're making their own protest. But Hamilton, interestingly, in a, in a foreshadowing of sorts, a week before his own duel, had written an op ed piece in the newspaper uh, lambasting the idea of pistol duels. And because he was Alexander Hamilton and because he had written that op ed piece, they decided to bury him here. Because he was against it. But he went and did the duel out of his honor, for honor, right? Yeah, I mean, him and Aaron Burr had so much conflict that after a while they just had to do something bad. What were they fighting over? The corporation of the Trinity? Of well, they disagreed Church? politically, you know? You know Burr, Burr sided more with uh, Thomas Jefferson. Yeah, and uh, uh, the, uh, Abigail Adams said that Aaron Burr was, quote, uh, the most insidious man of my generation. That was her description of him. And he was not that popular with a lot of uh, important people of that generation. No, in fact, after the duel, he kind of split and yeah. kind of faded from politics. Right, he became not so popular. Yeah. And the thing is that what was really at the core of the conflict, though, was uh, the issues of their banks. Because Alexander Hamilton had founded the first bank in New York, and Aaron Burr wanted to found the second one. And Hamilton was using his power and influence to keep that from happening because he wanted to be the only bank in New York. And then, so what Aaron Burr did was he got a legislation uh, thing, order, whatever you call that, uh, to form what was called a water company. Because the Collect Pond, which was the indigenous pond just north of City Hall, which had been the drinking water for the city, of course became polluted over time. So then they started giving rent to these water companies, and people would bring clean water into the city import. So under the auspices of a water company, uh, Aaron Burr founded what was known as the Manhattan Company, which as soon as he could, he turned into Manhattan Bank. After Hamilton died. After Hamilton died? No. No, no before he died. Yeah, so the, then there was this huge contest between the Bank of New York and the Manhattan Bank. And so when you think about it, this pistol deal between them is actually was the, was the first fleshed out corporate takeover. You know, and it's like the founding father was delivering his final lesson to us about how capitalism works by being gunned down by a rival bank. <laughs> and then the, the Manhattan Bank went on in its lifetime to merge several times and is now Chase Manhattan Bank. And apparently when you go into their tax papers, tax records, they're still officially known as a water company. Oh, wow. Oh, really? The Manhattan Company, yeah. Do you was... want me to carry your raincoat in my purse? Oh, thanks, yeah. I brought yeah, my poncho just in case. Think, you think it's going to rain? Hard to say. <laughs> yeah, let's cruise on over here. Okay. So many graves. <laughs> so little time. Look, I love some of these that are uh, decaying. Oh yeah, so you can't even re read the face of them. Where the five-year-olds were frolicking. Oh wow. Um, Peter Zinger is around here somewhere. I forget which one. Who's Peter Zinger? So Peter Zinger is a guy who is, um, he was a reporter. Zinger? In the, yeah, Zinger. Z. Zinger. This guy wrote an article uh, in the late 18th century, like the last decade of it, uh, and he was mocking, uh, no, no, earlier in the 18th century, like when this was still a colony, the British Empire, he mocked Governor Clinton, who was an English governor, and he was arrested for sedition, for 
the Sedition Act, and his court case took place in the original City Hall in New York, which was at Wall Street and Broad. And it was during that court case, in his own defense, that he used the idiom, freedom of the press. And he made it clear that if you, he said, guys, you know, if you want to have a democracy, and you want to you want to have a burgeoning nation, you got to let the reporters say what they feel. You know, you can't be censoring me on this level. And that was the antecedent and the seed for the First Amendment. And he's in here somewhere. Zinger? Zinger. Zinger. Yeah. Almost like that fast food, Zingers. Yeah. <laughs> it's a hostess dessert. Yeah, thank you. Toasted. That's right. <laughs> and Dolly Madison manufactures some of those. Wow. <laughs> and two days ago, we were in the house, we were at Betsy Ross's house in Philadelphia. Wow. Philadelphia just keeps coming back and round and round. Yeah, Philadelphia is in the air. I know. Philadelphia is actually really cool. It is. Yeah, there's like sections of the city that are just big law spaces with tons of art galleries. And yeah. It's super cheap. Right. There's nothing like eating. And South Street, Street is wondrous, man. I love that street. It's, oh, South Street's nuts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's also supposed to be incredibly seedy. A little. Me and Susan were talking about it on Saturday night, that cruise, but I had a romance. And it's a great place to have a romance. In Philly? Yeah. Sure. This is Bradford. Now, he's the guy who brought the printing press to North America. The first printing press. Picture. Which is a huge, um, that's a huge investment and commitment. You know, it's a dynamic choice. He literally was 92. That's amazing. Yeah, really. Age 68 years. That is, you know, it's hard no, to do it now. 92 years. Oh, yeah. wow. It's trying to do that today. Yeah, I mean, 92, that's a long time. Nobody lived, everybody died when they were like 15, 16. Yeah. It's amazing. Or even sooner. Yeah. He must have lived very healthily, a very healthy lifestyle. He must have, like, maybe he ate raw. Oh, wow. <laughs> Juice. Juice. Let Juice. it fast, Bob. <laughs> we're we're going to do it. Yeah, we're gonna do one tomorrow the next time. That's a great idea. It's a good time of year to do it too. So you don't it's have too to. Too hot. Yeah, you're not that hungry. Right. A lot of carrots, a lot of watercress, a lot of spinach, a lot of beets, celery, parsley. It's gonna be so good. What a cleansing. Onions. That that big one. It looks like it looks like the top of a church, and the rest of the yeah. church is subterranean. Yeah. That is like a, a tomb for the unknown soldier, but for the Revolutionary, Revolutionary War. Revolutionary War, yeah. And they were soldiers that were prisoners of war who died under the British uh, captivity at that time. And you know, New York City was lost. George Washington lost New York City in the first year of the Revolutionary War, the Battle of Washington Heights. And New York was an occupied city for seven out of the eight years of, um, yeah. of the Revolutionary War. And that really did, was one of those things that set the mentality for the city also. You know, uh, the fact that it was occupied for a long time early on in its history. And uh, we're starting to get a good view of the uh, World Trade Center. The uh, World Trade Centers are actually uh, a sculpture uh, created by the great city teacher. And um, the sculpture is entitled Sibling Rivalry. <laughs> and, uh, they're uh, twin towers, the twin towers. And you'll notice that one is always trying to look taller than the other. And um, depending on, <laughs> on where you stand in the city, one often succeeds right. in looking taller than the other. But at all times, they're identical. They're also phallic symbols, twin phallic symbols. Well, that's also probably why they're trying to look, one's trying to look taller than the other. <laughs> and then the, the, the gap between them represents um, non-communication. And then it's like they've, they've got their backs to each other, their arms folded. Will the World Trade Centers ever speak to one another again? I think no. is the core question in, in the landmark. Didn't some guy, a French uh, uh, guy walk across the two, between the two buildings, yeah, like yeah. on a tight rope? Uh, yeah, tight rope one Philip uh, Le Peep or Le... Yeah, like in the called. 70s. Yeah. It was around the same time that guy climbed Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Being on TV yeah, or something. Le, hearing about uh, it. Yeah, it was hardcore. Once you're up, when I'm up on the observation deck, that's the last thing that occurs to me. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't occur to it's me It's also all. windy he up didn't there, fall? you know? He made it, right? Yeah, he made I it. assume he made it. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> My memory is that he made it. <laughs> I hope you Philip made it. Philip Lateef, Lapeep. Le, like le, yeah, Lapeep. The what? Uh, this is where, according to legend, Peter Minuet made the famous transaction with the passing Native American tribe for $24 and purchased Manhattan Island. 
was it's probably a, good, a, a barter deal. It's a good deal. But in any case, it was this very gesture of transaction that gave birth to this, whatever this is, that we're currently dwelling in and walking in. And um, it's a very interesting human gesture, this invention that we call transaction. And it's so central to the, to the mythology of Manhattan. And what is it? What is the transaction? And I would say that the transaction, just like the city that it gave birth to, is a mixture of our need for each other and our, our fear of each other. You know? I mean, if I was them, you know, I'm going to buy something from you, Susan, right now. And, um, you know, I'm going to try to buy something from you, like this. Now, the thing is, is that just by reaching out, so oh, nice. Yeah, I'm going to buy some deodorant from Susan. Now, just buy it. It's very convenient. Just in case. Secret. Well, let's enact this I've transaction. Crossed, I've crossed off the price. Right. I'm glad. <laughs> that way I can just give you $5 and we know that that's reasonable. <laughs> All right, so let's transact. It might even be a little too much. I have to give you change. So now, in this moment of the transaction that we're living out here, you can see clearly that I have entered Susan's personal space. And the interconnection of the human race is, is real. And every every city I've ever gone to and every citizen I've ever visited of every city needs a hug. And so on a very raw and primal level, I'm psyched to be in Susan's personal space. At the same time, don't think I'm just hanging out in your personal space. I have very profitable and constructive reason to be here. It's not just that some discotheque I want to hang out in. I don't want you to feel that interfering with your personal space. No? And notice that I'm also really at all times keeping you at an arm's length by handing you the bill and not not feeding it to you with my teeth. Or that's not the right way to do a transaction. This is the right way and it's at an arm's length. And so you can clearly see here that the transaction is, uh, is me needing you trying to get into your personal space and finding a reason to be there. At the same time, it's the fear that keeps the straight arm going, keep you at an arm's distance. And so that the transaction is really just a mediocre form of human intercourse. And eventually, it's just bad sex. And, uh, it's the bad sex that's happening all over the city every day. And it's the bad sex that gave, gave birth to the city. You know, And really, the city was born of, of mediocre sex. Well, um, it, it, regarding a transaction, when men shake hands, what was that born of? Similar idea. Yeah, only yeah. it was to show, it was to greet somebody, but it was also to show that you were unarmed. Right, right. Because um, there is that know. constant like need and fear. The whole city is an ongoing medley. Do you want a nice you know? coffee? Sure. Yeah. Do you want one? Let's grab an ice coffee. Yeah. I'll get them here. Let's do a transaction and get the ice coffee. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll live out of real one. <laughs> Thank you for it's that exhibition avoidable. books. They always teach you that cities form because of commerce. But I think really the, the reason the city forms is because we need each other. You know, th there's a gregariousness in our blood. And we, we learn from each other, you know, because like, if you and I went and meditated in a cave for the next 30 years, I'm sure it would be incredible. But I, I would argue that there's some basic things we wouldn't learn right. until we're dealing with each other, like on this level. Right. And so the city is this ongoing medley of our need for each other and our fear of each other. And those are like the basic ingredients of a New York afternoon. Need and fear. Need. Yeah. Fear and desire. Yeah. Yeah, and the transaction really encompasses all of it. Like, mm -hmm. like, well, is it arguably is desire and need? Could you replace that? Well, I think as an artist, it's important to differentiate between want and need. You know, um, that's a really and, important. Uh, even in life, and not just as in an art, but in general, like yeah. want and need. Your wants and desires yeah. can be used. What do you need? Um, can Money? I have $5? Yeah, I don't know how much it's going to be. Okay. I was going to get a chocolate. Let's chip. transact. <laughs> I have a 20 in there. How about if I take this? Take the 20. I'll hang on to the 10. No, we transacted, it's fine. <laughs> the transaction is correct. <laughs> now this is a custom, the U.S. Custom House. It was, yeah. Now it's called the Museum of the American Indian. Thanks, man. Keep it alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that couple of those, that's pretty surreal. Yeah. A Civil War reenactment? Yeah. Did you go to Gettysburg, or? I know, no, but in, in California, 
I went to a reenactment of Bull Run. Oh, wow. And it was cool to be in California, but in the Battle of Bull Run. <laughs> <laughs> but the people are really serious about it, right? Oh, the men were sprawled out on the ground begging for whiskey. They were wounded. They were in pain. <laughs> I was, I was like, somebody get whiskey for these men. <laughs> and they also, but like they're really thorough about like the threading that's used in their costumes and the muscles. You walk around certain like, parts of the mission district, you got men lying around the street begging for whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> Different kind of war. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, um, this also was an immigrant station. And at that time it was called Castle Garden. And there is a colloquialism in Yiddish. When you walk into like the kitchen and it's really busy, you say, oh, Boy, this is a Kessel Garden, and uh, that was uh, uh, that is referring to this place when it was an immigrant station because it was such a chaotic scene. Eventually, it became so chaotic they moved the immigrant station to Ellis Island. Oh, so this was pre Ellis Island, right? Before Ellis Island, it was here in this fortress, impotent fortress. <laughs> <laughs> Castle Clinton, Battery Park. And after you get your ticket for the ferry boat, you come out here for the actual line that leaves the ferry boat. Now, on many days, you know, this line of the ferry boat, especially even earlier today, probably was an hour long, an hour and a half just to get to the boat. Oh, my God. And, you know, the operation that runs the whole thing is just one company, I don't, it's just like a lot of Irish guys basically together who run the thing, and they have a total monopoly on it. You know, it's the only boat that goes to the statue. Right. And, like, so many times I would see that they, they have this law, this rule that you have to buy your ticket before you get in line. So if you have like 10 or 12 people in your group and you're facing an hour and a half line anyway, what a lot of people would do is they would send one emissary into the ticket line to get your ticket and right. send everybody else into the main line. Because by the time you get the tickets, you're still gonna have another 60 minutes of oh, waiting in at line. least, yeah. So the, some of the bouncers from the boat go down and make and sure, make that sure that everybody has a ticket. And so when they catch like a group of 10, that still don't have all their tickets, they tell them all they've got to go back to the end of the line, which of course starts a skirmish that would always result in a bribe, you know, because the guys uh, are like 20 yeah. $40, like we can forget about it. And it's like, you realize that this whole ticket rule is insane. <laughs> it's got no purpose other than to manufacture a little more cash. And the point is, is that there was corruption every step of the way uh, going out to the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> every time I came down, it still run it? Oh yeah, yeah, it's a total monopoly. And um, I just love all the metaphors for, for trying to get out to liberty. If you're trying to get to liberty, you gotta go through all this. You have to have some transactions. Yeah, they gotta, you gotta know how to work it. <laughs> There's Ellis Island with the turret. Now officially in New Jersey. Is that right? They made it in New Jersey now. Yeah, that's why they had to change the, uh, the name of New York from the Empire, from the Liberty State to the Empire State. Oh, I see, I see. You see the Verrazano Bridge just carrying over the land uh -huh. over there. And that is where Verrazano himself, the discoverer, uh, sat, stood on his boat in 1508, as he put it, at the mouth of a great river between two hills. <laughs> that was his description of the place. And what is this building over there? That's, uh, that's Ellis Island. That's, that's Ellis Island. Right. And, but then. But but the Statue of Liberty isn't on the same island. No, is it's it? a separate island. It's, it's Liberty Island. Liberty Island. Yeah. Okay. That's Liberty not Liberty Island. Island. The sculptor of the Statue of Liberty, Bartholdi, first came on a transatlantic journey to try to find the right spot for his Colossus, which was at that point a blueprint. You know, it was a thought, and he knew that that island would be perfect when you come out of the harbor. You're just facing it directly. What he didn't know at the time was that that was called Bedloe's Island, and it was actually a prison. <laughs> it actually had a, no. a gallows. Uh, it still had a working gallows on the island when they uh, decided to set it aside for Lady Liberty. Wow. After it was assembled, they, they brought it over in pieces, and there are all these famous photographs of the limbs and the torch, like in Madison Square Park, and they were sticking. They were trying to get money to raise to build the pedestal. I thought it was a gift from France. France gave us a statue, but they didn't pay for the pedestal. Exactly, you know. And so Americans on a deep level, because they were Americans, knew that it was just not a good investment. I mean, to build some pedestal for this big statue personifying liberty in the middle of, har of the harbor, that's just not, there's no payback there. Like. Right, there's no upside. <laughs> so Joseph Pulitzer, who is from St. Louis uh, via Europe, uh, kind of an immigrant in his own way, uh, and a great newspaper publisher, 
uh, started, uh, and his, his argument was like, look, it's a gift for the people of France. So the pedestal should be for the people of America, not just a few rich business guys. So um, he started saying that he would print the name of everybody who contributed to the pedestal, even if your contribution was one penny, was one cent. You get your name in print. Get your name in print. So not only did he get the pedestal built, he sold a lot of newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great if American. If people wanted to see their name, they'd yeah. buy it. It's a great American. It's a great American. <laughs> Same thing as like, people wanting to be on TV now. There's no difference. Yeah, yeah. And then the um, the uh, the pedestal was finally designed by Richard Morris Hunt, who also designed uh, the facade of the Metropolitan Museum. And that oh, really? It's got some similarities. And the very bottom of it, that triangular structure below the pedestal, is one of the three fortresses that was built in 1812. And the third one is over there on Governor's Island. Uh -huh. and you can see this was the triangle, right. and they were going to trap the British in that triangle there. The British found out. The British knew, so they went to Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> they went to Boston. The uh, statue was originally the thought of French Democrats. You know, they were trying to uh, get the French inspired about being de democracy by linking it to the American Revolution and the French Revolution. And so they were going to celebrate the centennial of the American Revolution by building the statue. And um, it was just kind of a coincidence that Ellis Island ended up out there and that the immigrants would pass right by the statue on the way to Ellis Island. Right, the French right. really didn't know that was going to happen. Right. And in the coronation ceremony for the statue in 1886, there was not one mention of the word immigrant. The word immigrant never came up in the, uh, any of the oratories by Grover Cleveland or anybody else. Oh, really? And um, the uh, statue itself is, uh, the, the face of the statue is based on Bartholdi's mother and the body on his mistress at the time, his girlfriend. And um, <laughs> I think in his own way, I think he's stating that what liberty really is, is the harmonious medley of the major women in your life. <laughs> harmonious melody. <laughs> you can get all the major women in your life really to work together. I his mother, I don't know. <laughs> well, that may be the, uh, that's an important Toward the kitchen. Ooh. See how they make those Delmonico steaks. This is a good view of Wall Street Lunches. <laughs> Uh-oh, Robert Kennedy walked through this place. <laughs> Didn't go too well. Didn't go too well. <laughs> <laughs> no, in the Ritz campaign. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're doing a tour. I think I think that uh, we should definitely rent this place out for a party sometime. It's so cool. Wow. It's really, it's a great space. Um, these banks wow. date back to 1898. The original bank vaults. Um, Philadelphia rears its head once again. There it is, Philadelphia again. It's been a theme today. Oh, it's really? been a theme for the week. <laughs> <laughs> Is your name uh, Shelly? Stacy. Stacy, I'm sorry. I knew there was an S and a Y. <laughs> <laughs> this is open too during the party. Like, yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is room too. This room is called the Remington Ball. Oh, I'm very delighted to be here. They're all the original houses. Stacy has the boxes. Did anybody leave anything? Boxes, um, 
you know, change the colors with right. gels, gels or stencils or like a negative if it's like a wedding couple or something like that. Right, it's right. really great. And the ones that open, sometimes people put um, like party favors in them or jewels. Some of it's our own storage. So. <laughs> this is uh, hardcore. We do events in just one room or both. It really you know, just kind of a big school. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you could do a lap. It's a really, really great space. And they move things, you know, small, tiny people, like small, tiny people, like the, the 400 for a special year. It's a wine vault. Exactly. <laughs> Actually, it's about a year and a half old How are things going? Well? Yeah, very well. Yeah, cool. It's fun. Is it busy for lunch because there's so many people who mm -hmm. and then lunch is huge out here? When do they open this at night? This part, um, oftentimes during the week we'll use it for lunch, a la carte seating as well, and then at night we use it for private events. If there's not an event going on, some Thursday evenings we'll do um, a lounge night type of thing. Are you guys oh. open for dinner as well? Dinner upstairs, yes. yes. Um, this generally is just dedicated to private events. It's great. <laughs> so what else have we been today? We, uh, we were over at Battery Park, and uh, we were in the Trinity Church uh, Cemetery. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we've been checking out the sites. Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> They're so happy it hasn't rained. Oh, my yeah. goodness. Yeah. Yeah. No. Is it really humid out? No, it's, it's a little humid, but it's not so bad. It's not that muggy. It isn't. <laughs> Okay. I was wondering about that actually. I'm like, okay, I hope it rains while well. I'm in work, you know, at work today and get rid of all the humidity. <laughs> and when I go out, it's still fun. It could still happen. I'm sure. I'm yeah. sure it'll be right when I'm leaving. That's usually what happens. <laughs> you strained your hair today and you're like, ah. <laughs> every, day, every day I come down here when it's raining, I'm like, Phew. my hair suddenly shrunk. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's such a great space. It's amazing. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I mean, and the lights are lowered. We do votives everywhere. Votives fit um, between all those bottles, so it really lights them up really beautifully. Really unique space. I can't find it anywhere. What's the combination? <laughs> Sorry, they don't tell me that. That's why we both said it over. I don't know. I could listen to the tumblers. There's something yeah, spacious about that. Like, mm -hmm. but, it's very out of this world. Thank you so much for showing us. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> Looks like, you know, Robin's like on the, on the outside of the submarine. <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool. Honestly, the thing that gets me is like, it's not like someone said, I want to design a place that looks like it was a bank vault, you know, it'll be a great space. So like, this is. It the really real was. deal, yeah. yeah. And that's still, it gets me every day. I just think it's so fascinating. Me too. I just love it down here. When did this cease being a, a functioning bank? Um, they just bought it. Well, I mean, I don't know if JP Morgan used it as a bank vault as well at all, or, you know, or Payne Weber if they used these as their own vaults per se, but it was just bought for residential, I believe, probably like five, ten years ago okay. at the most. And now it's all residential apartments above us. Condos. Are they amazing spaces? Are they cool? The apartments? Yeah. Yeah, the penthouses are gorgeous. We do events on the rooftop sometimes, and so it's kind of cool. Yeah, it would be good down here to do a rooftop thing, too. Yeah, you see the water, you see the, like, yeah. you know, all the, the skyline, the yeah. street. It's really, really nice. Okay, ready? Speed taking some notes. Took a couple of notes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Stacey. No problem. If you want, I can show you it this way. Oh, okay. I can actually the door looks like it's kind of blocked on us. Uh -oh. Uh oh. Well, the vault door doesn't close yeah. on us. I'm so glad to, uh, to have you here, Stacey. Mm -hmm. Great energy. You're, you're anxious to share the space, which is really nice. Thank you. I think people should see it. And so that was the vine. Bye. Thank you. Thanks again.
marble. Um, so As we were spat back on um, to Broad Street. and images that will come to you that are perhaps unstoppable. But if you, you take a moment and take a deep breath and just view the statue objectively as a man in 18th century regalia hanging out on the street corner, he's got one hand clenched by his side and the other hand is being held out because he wants somebody to hold it. He's looking for somebody to hold his hand. And the entire roster of events that I just rattled off, I think emanate from the very beginning, which is uh, the first anecdote before all of them, which was George Washington reaching out his hand to be held. And the stakes raise every rush hour when millions of people pass right by him, totally ignoring uh, his reached out hand. He's beckoning. He's beckoning for the hand holding. Your new hand is kind of looking sort of um Founding father at Yes. Well, isn't it? Feelingly. Like, Especially with the humidity, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm becoming uh, a founding father. I'm yeah. <laughs> That's a It looks emotion. like maybe his dog should be there. Like he wants to pet his yeah, dog. Yeah, he might want to pet a dog or it's something a, cuddly should be there. I some mean, gesture yeah. of, a child of intimacy. Maybe Stuffed a animal. child's head. Something, yeah. Something more, yeah. Flushy. His head is definitely being held out. Yeah. 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 He's which? Very serious. Yes. Yeah, he's, yeah, he doesn't look like a happy camper, really. He's got something somber going on there. Because he's got a big job. He's had, yeah, it's a lot of responsibility, and he's all alone up there. All alone. And then this is Wall Street, which, what is the wall? You know, was the fortress, the, the, the defensive wall that the Dutch built uh, when they first arrived. And there's many debates as to why the wall was particularly here. You know, some believe it was built uh, to segregate Native American tribes from the Dutch. Others feel it was built facing the north because that's where the English were. The English were in New England. And of course the Dutch and the English were nemesis at that time. They were wrestling all over the world. But I think on a more metaphysical plane, the Dutch built the wall here because they were facing an unlabeled continent of boundless possibility. And when faced with boundlessness, human beings have a tendency to build walls. That's depressing. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also probably very true. Yeah. And that wall building, that defensive mentality against possibility, really does set the tone for this whole neighborhood. There's that. Uh, check out the facade of the J.P. Morgan building. This is the J.P. Morgan uh, guarantee. It doesn't have a sign on it because J.P. Morgan said anybody who doesn't know what this building is is a loser. <laughs> and I don't want them to know about it. They don't know already. <laughs> and then uh, the, uh, there's all these indentations in the marble over here. And um, it's a uh, residual uh, impact from a bomb that exploded on the sidewalk in 1920. Wow. And actually, it was the deadliest terrorist explosion in New York history. Do they know who did it? There was an anarchist group that blamed J.P. Morgan for America's participation in World War I because they believed, and, and many still do believe, that America really got involved with that war because J.P. Morgan was so heavily invested in Europe and that his investments were the cornerstone of the American economy. So uh, the anarchists, as a vengeful action of protest, tried to kill his son, J.P. Morgan Jr., by exploding a bomb on the sidewalk when uh, J.P. Morgan Jr. was getting out of a car. They killed uh, about 30 people. Um, but J.P. Morgan Jr. walked away unscathed. Uh, and the, the impact on the marble can still be seen. Wow. But it was far deadlier attack than the World Trade Center explosion that happened a few years ago. That killed about 18 people? I think more like six or seven. Six. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, way more than Yeah. Did the window break? I don't know. I assume that the windows would have broken from the thing. There's something that seems more qualified about it, though. That guy just, you know, took me the pages, but mindlessly flew it up. Yeah. Because they're trying to do something to live. Oh, she was talking about the World Trade Center. Yeah. Oh, the World Trade the World Trade Center bombing. Yeah, Tiffany McVeigh. No, that would be that would be the federal oh, building. That was Oklahoma Obama City. Like 167. That's hard to happened. keep up with all the explosions. All these explosions, <laughs> all these bombings. Sometimes we chase after this. So if they if they they blew up, they blew up a bomb. Yeah. Uh, it, was that just shrapnel from the bomb? Yeah. yeah it was like, all the way up. Pretty intense. Huh? Like, yeah. I like the fact that they've left the marks yeah. on the building. Yeah, of course. There's no way. plaque here or anything that commemorates yeah. it. or. No, that's horrible. There should be. You know, it's wrong. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so the, the anarchists often did have very poignant messages along with their desecrations. It's true, you know. An anarchist shot President uh, McKinley. Garfield, right? Wasn't it McKinley or? I mean, who's the one in Buffalo? McKinley. McKinley. Yeah, that was the only true political assassination in American history. That was all the other ones were more personal or from gossip, but the assassination of McKinley was made was done by an anarchist in the name of a, a political movement. Yeah, you could you could argue that that was, but it was also so theatrical. <laughs> I think it was more of a theatrical gesture than a political. <laughs> I mean, it was an actor. Yeah, in a theater. Stage, I mean, it was... <laughs> no, but what he said was, thus ever to tyrants, which is the state motto of uh, Virginia. Is that right? Uh, Six Semper Tyrannus is what he screamed as he jumped onto the stage. The so, dagger held. Yeah. It was kind of a political assassination. Oh, it was. Yeah. He demonized Lincoln. <laughs> but it's also very tactile, like you want to... Yeah. Damn. What's that little castle on top of the building? I don't know that building. I love the castle. That there's a little castle on top. Yeah. <laughs> That's your future fortress. Yeah, wouldn't that be great? You gotta live there? Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah. So where are we going now? Let's go up Nassau Street. This way. Oh, it's right here. There's a great view on that corner. This is the final vision of Brunelleschi, like the man who discovered perspective in the Renaissance. And like perhaps in his last breath of life, he envisioned this, this scene, you know, because there's so much perspective here and just in this vision. There's a good view of 40 Wall Street, which was the building and contest of the Chrysler building. You know, they were being built at the same time. And 40 was, Wall? Yeah. There's and another good example they, of a couple of the, phallic images in pursuit of being the highest. And then they put that big thing on top of the Chrysler. Yeah, Van Allen secretly puts the pyramid on top of the Chrysler to make sure that it's 123 feet taller than, than 40 <laughs> Wall Street. <laughs> Let's throw a rock at it. <laughs> but I love the fact that you're sitting there. Sitting there yeah. the With a hat. Yeah. It's a, hat. It's a lot That's of a trust. Cool image. That's an act of trust.